Father, we do ask in your grace that you would help us to understand these, these truths this morning. And as we understand them in your grace, we pray that you would provide us with the ability to be obedient. We pray for relationships here at Bethany uh, to reflect uh, your design for your church in these areas. We pray this, uh, beseeching you in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Well, again, all of us are going to find ourselves in relationships in which restoration needs to take place. I'm going to sin against you. You're going to sin against me. There's going to be separation in our relationship. And and something's going to need to take place in order for us to be restored in fellowship with one another. That's going to happen. It's inevitable. Now, in a church culture that's legalistic, restoration, that, that healing of relationship, is going to be based upon works and not grace. In a church in which legalism reigns, that process of of restoration of relationship is going to be based upon works and not grace. In other words, instead of me graciously extending a kindness and forgiveness toward you and, and that being what initiates restoration or you extending that toward me if I've wronged you, instead in a, in a, in a legalistic culture, restoration is going to be based upon works. Have you done what you needed to do in order to earn grace? Have you done what you needed to do in order for grace to be extended to you and restoration to begin to take place? That's what's going to take place in a legalistic church culture. I mentioned a couple months ago that I was reading the book Les Mis by Victor Hugo. And that was true a couple months ago, but it is a really long book. Uh, And I, as I have done so many times before, started the book with great fervor and excitement. And um, I think I'm going to start it again here very soon. Uh, Whitney, though, Whitney started reading it, and she just, she has just uh, kept on reading it. And she's kind of, it's been convicting watching her read it. Uh, I feel a little bit dumb sometimes. And she she keeps on uh, reading little little snippets, little gems uh, from the novel, things that, that Hugo says, and, and uh, just some, some beautiful messages in the novel about grace and about forgiveness and about that contrasted with legalism. And so it caught me thinking about it this past week. And I was thinking about the character Jean Valjean. And if you've seen the, the musical or seen a movie version of it, or read it, uh, don't brag, but if you've read the whole thing, uh, you know that he's, he's one of the main characters of, of this, this novel. Jean Valjean is a person who tried to provide for his nieces and nephews, and he broke into a bakery at night and stole a loaf of bread. He was caught and sentenced to five years in prison, and eventually became 19 years because of his uh, trying to escape. And and listen to what Hugo says about Jean Valjean as he thinks about what he's done. Listen to what Hugo, Hugo writes. Jean Valjean recognized that he was not an innocent man. He acknowledged that he had committed an extreme and blamable action, that the loaf perhaps would not have been refused him if he had asked for it, that in all events it would have been better for him to wait either for pity or for work to get the loaf of bread. He should have been patient. That would have been better, even for those poor little ones for whom he stole. It was was an act of folly, imagining that he could escape misery by theft. In short, Jean Valjean concludes, he had done wrong. Now, what happens in in the novel, though, is that the the path back to the light, the path back toward toward righteousness and and, and inclusion into society is a path that he, he can't obtain. He can't find it. There's a a legalistic society in in which it it prevents him from being able to be welcomed back into society. He says, he he wonders as he thinks about what what he has done, is it right to be between a lack and an excess forever? A lack of work on one hand and an excess of punishment on the other. That's where Jean Valjean feels as he contemplates his crime, as he lives in this this legalistic society, the sting of the excessiveness of his punishment, instead of 
this punishment welcoming him back into society, restoring him to society, it, it pushes him further away. Now, there's another character in the, the novel that represents legalism. It's Javert, the, the police officer. And there's this description of Javert, the police officer, that is a, a beautiful description of legalism. Victor Hugo writes that, that French peasants sometimes believed that a wolf, when she had a, a pack of cubs, would select one cub to kill, believing that cub would grow up and, and devour its, its siblings. And, and Victor Hugo writes, if that cub that would grow up and devour its siblings had a human face, it would be the, the face of Javert. This legalistic fervor that instead of extending grace is, is concentrated on the law and in the zeal and the passion for the law is willing to devour his brothers and sisters. That's legalism. Legalism, instead of extending grace towards those who have fallen, it extends rules and regulations and, 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 and obstacles to fullness of inclusion of relationship. And, and uh, as we in, in the church think about those who have fallen, we can either struggle with lawlessness where we don't even talk about sin, or we can struggle as a church with legalism, with believing, okay, before grace can be extended, here's what you have to do. And in, in a church that struggles with legalism, the path of restoration is not a path of joy. It's not a path of grace. It's a sorrowful path that may or may not ever lead to fullness of relationships being healed and restored. Here's what I want us to think about this morning as we look at this text. Here's the main idea I want us to grasp. You and I, as we encounter what Paul writes here in the book of Galatians, you and I have been entrusted by God not with the ministry of legalism, not with the, the ministry of, of condemnation in one another's lives. You and I have been entrusted by God with the ministry, the goal of restoring one another to Christ and his church. Sometimes you are going to be the, the person who, who needs to be restored in relationship because of sin. Sometimes I am going to be, need to be the person who needs to be restored in relationship because of sin. But all of us, as we exist in this, this community of faith, this church, the body of Christ, all of us have been entrusted by God with the ministry of restoring one another to Christ and to the church. And what we're going to do this week and next week, we're going to spend two weeks talking about this, and, and we're going to kind of look at four categories in which we need to think about this. We're going to talk about the participants in reconciliation, who needs to be involved in this ministry of reconciliation, the, the participants, and then we're going to talk about the goal of restoration. What's our, our goal as we try to restore people to the body of Christ? And then we're going to talk about the manner of reconciliation, the manner of reconciliation, how this takes place, and then we're going to talk about the dangers of reconciliation. What are some things we need to be cautious about in our life and the lives of others as we engage in the ministry of, of reconciling one another in a relationship? So let's, oh, and, and as we go through, as kind of each of these four areas, we're going to be drawing out some principles, okay? And so some principles will help us in this endeavor. Okay, let's, let's dive into it. Let's first of all talk about the participants in restoration. The participants in restoration. And here's how Paul begins chapter 6. Brothers, he says, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Now, hopefully you see here there's kind of two categories of people here, right, in this verse. Who are the participants? Well, there's the person who needs to be restored, and there's the, the person or the people who are going to be engaged in restoration. So there's the restoree and the restorers. Let's, let's first of all talk about the person who needs restoration. Who is this restoree? Notice a couple things that Paul tells us about this person. First of all, notice he says, if, if anyone, if, if anyone is caught in any transgression. So in other words, we shouldn't be surprised 
to find all sorts of people who need to be restored. It's the rich person, it's the poor person, it's the young person, it's the old person, it's the new Christian, it's the old Christian, it's, it's the, the, the Sunday school teacher, it's the pastor elder. It, it shouldn't surprise us when we encounter a person in the church who needs restoration. We couldn't say, well, boy, I, I, I can't believe that that person would need restoration. No, Paul says, look, if anyone, this is not something that should shock us when we find a person in the church who needs this type of restoration. And I'm sure all of us, if we've been in the church for any amount of time, can think about peoples in all different categories who have found themselves in this situation. A, a family member, longtime friends, new converts, people in positions of, of leadership who have fallen in very tragic ways. We can think of, of people who have fallen in, from various circumstances into various circumstances. It's, it's tragic, right? But not surprising, in fact, sometimes I talk to a person and we're, we're talking about where they are spiritually. So, you know what, I, I, I used to be in the church, but then a, a person in leadership, a, a pastor was, was caught in an immorality or was just kind of a, 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 a power-hungry individual or this person in leadership acted this way and it, 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 it shook my faith. And I think, well, well, why would that shake your faith? I mean, if God said, look, people in positions of leadership are never going to fall, and then they fell, then I'd say, okay, I see why you don't trust God anymore. But, but what has God said in his word? He says, look, if anyone, like, like any person can find themselves in this, this circumstance. And so what happens when a person in a position of leadership falls is, look, exactly what God said could potentially happen, ha could happen is happening. If anything, it should strengthen your faith and cause you to fear sin more, Right? So in other words, we have this person who needs restoration. The first thing we notice is it can, be, it can be anyone. It can be anyone. The second thing we notice, Paul uses the word, if anyone is caught, he uses the word caught in a transgression. The idea is a person's been overtaken by sin. It's, it's kind of a very compassionate word for Paul to use here. Jesus is described as, as the friend of who? the friend of sinners. And, and Paul here, as he describes this person being caught in transgression, the idea is that they've been, they've been overtaken by sin. And so I, I think there's a very very kind sense in which Paul is, is talking about this person. So he says, here's anyone, and, and they've been overtaken, they've been caught, they've been exposed in their sin. He says, if anyone was caught in, in any transgression. And what, is, what does he mean by transgression there? Well, look, look at your Bibles, and let's go back to what I didn't finish talking about last week. Go back to the end of chapter 5, and let's, let's notice what Paul is saying here. Remember the instruction in chapter 5 is to walk by the Spirit. Walk by the Spirit, and you don't gratify the desires of the flesh. Here's the, here's the, the flesh, here's the Spirit. The Spirit's opposed to the flesh, the flesh is opposed to the Spirit. Walk by the Spirit, you won't gratify the desires of the flesh. Then you come to the end of chapter 5, and Paul says... After talking about the fruit of the Spirit, he says those who belong to Christ Jesus have, have crucified the flesh. And that kind of reminds us of what we read in Galatians 2.20. Uh, uh, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So in, in the past, the, the flesh has been crucified. And what needs to happen is there needs to be, this is very important. So we're talking about the transgression this person has been caught in. What needs to happen is, is a, a continual recognition that the flesh needs to die. I've, I've been freed from the flesh. This whole section is about freedom in Christ. I've been freed from the power of the flesh. Now I need to continue to, to live like that. John Stott, as he's talking about the, this passage, talks about what crucifixion means. A crucifixion is a decisive act. Crucifixion is, is pitiless. The, the person who was crucified in the Roman culture was shown no pity. We don't coddle the flesh. We don't excuse the flesh. Hey, this is just the way I am. We don't uh, excuse our behavior. We, we, we're, we're pitiless. We say, I'm, I'm going to put the flesh to death. So he says, we crucify the flesh. And then he says, we, if, if that's happened, if that's true, and we're continuing to live that way, our job as disciples is to take up our cross daily, crucify the flesh, follow Christ, and we he says, keep in step 
with the Spirit at the end of chapter 5. We live by the Spirit. Let's also walk by the Spirit. We keep in step by the Spirit. We've talked about that a lot of the last few weeks. We're clinging to the gospel. We're asking God to help us. We're reading his word and believing it, trusting it, and we're acting on it. So we're, we're putting to death the deeds of the flesh. We're merciless and removing the flesh from our lives. And, and we're clinging to the gospel and following after Christ as we walk in the Spirit. And then he gives some examples of what it looks like to, to not do that. If, if you are not walking in the Spirit, you're going to be conceited. And conceited people provoke and conceited people envy. We don't want any of those things in our life. So what I think Paul is saying now is he says, okay, that, that's what we're supposed to be doing. Put to death the flesh and walk in the spirit. But now we have this person here, and it's, it's anyone. It could be you, it could be me, it could be a family member, it could be a, a, a deacon, it could be an elder pastor. I mean, it could be anybody. And here's this person, and they have not done what Paul instructs them to do. Instead of walking in the spirit, instead of putting to death the deeds of the flesh, they have walked in the flesh. And it's been... I think the idea here is it's, it's been continual in it. And maybe at first they didn't even, they weren't conscious of what they were doing. Maybe they just made a, a couple of compromises in their lifestyle. Maybe they just kind of began to walk down the path, kind of th thinking they could just kind of tiptoe just a little bit down that path. And now all of a sudden, boy, I almost fell. I almost <laughs> illustrated uh, <laughs> what happened in Sunday. My pastor fell publicly. Um, that would not have been good. I make people nervous sometimes standing so close, but I've never been nervous before. Okay, um, what happened? We've, you begin, this, this person has been caught in transgression, and it could be anybody. That's the first principle, okay? Here, here's the first principle. Any person in the church can be overtaken by sin. Any person in the church can be overtaken by sin. My uh, grandmother, for, for 20 years, she had this little uh, joke that she had clipped out of a church bulletin, taped to her refrigerator. And it was, a, it was a story about a pastor walking down a country road and finding three little boys and a stray dog. And, and he asked the little boys, he said, what, what, what are you guys doing with this, this dog? And the little boy piped up, he said, well, we found this stray dog, pastor, and um, we all want to keep him, and so we're having a contest. We're all telling lies, and the person with the best lie gets to keep the dog. And the pastor looks at the boys, and he says, oh my goodness, that is, that's a terrible thing. Lying is, is horrible. Why, why, boys, I would never have done that when I was your age. And the boys look at each other, and the, the first boy goes, you win, pastor. Here's the dog, right? You know? So... <laughs> no, it's a 20, it's like a 30 year old joke now. But um, so the, 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 the idea is that as, as we encounter people in sin, it, it doesn't shock us, right? We're, we're not some sort of hypocritical uh, religious people who say, I, I can't believe that other people would, would, would think that way or could do those things. We realize any person in the church can be overtaken by, by sin. Now, we also see here, we also see the person who are, the people who are going to be doing the restoration, the people who are going to be doing the restoring. What does Paul say? He says, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore a person. So, so who is doing the restoring? Well, it's the spiritual ones. You say, well, thank goodness it's them. I'm off the hook. You know, I'm not, I'm not super spiritual. I'm kind of one of the eh ones, you know. Uh, that must be like the, the really super, like the Sunday school teachers. This must be the, the people who serve in the nursery all the time. I mean, it's those people, right? No. Remember what Paul said in Galatians 5. He says, look, you collectively need to walk in the Spirit. Paul is, envisions a community of faith where, where everyone is, is spiritual, where everyone's walking in the Spirit. And so he says, you who are spiritual, in other words, you who are part of the church, who are walking in the Spirit, who are being obedient to what I've said, all of you have this, this responsibility. In fact, that's the second principle, right? The second principle is that each of us should be prepared to help restore our brothers and sisters in Christ. Every single one of us should be prepared to engage in the ministry of restoration. 
We're prepared in multiple ways. We're prepared spiritually. We're prepared emotionally. We're prepared in terms of our desire. Uh, let me show you a little uh, picture that I, I found helpful. Uh, this is from the book, Biblical Counseling in the Church. And we went through this with uh, some of our, our care group leaders and elders and, and deacons uh, on Friday mornings for a while ago. I'm not sure how well you can see this. I can see it really well uh, this close. But there's, there's two continuums. The, the, the chart says discipleship and counseling continuum. And this, this, this figure kind of describes how many people think about discipleship and counseling in the church. You see on the left-hand side, you have discipleship, right? And so here's discipleship, and maybe they think, okay, I'm a, I'm a Christian, so I should be involved in discipleship. And then over on, on the other side, you have counseling. And that's for like certain people in the church who are, who are trained, and, and those people should be in, involved in counseling. And they, we often view these things as two totally separate things. Discipleship, that kind of helps us grow in our faith. Counseling is for the people who need restoring, who need some help. Here's another chart, and I think this is a more biblical way to understand what needs to take place in a church. And this is how we at Bethany, as we are in relationship with one another, are trying to design our ministries to think and our relationships to think about discipleship and care. Instead of saying counseling is over here and discipleship is over here, instead you have a situation where we have discipleship and, and counseling all in this the same continuum. On one end, you have intentional relationships. And so I'm, I'm getting involved in your life, and we're, we're just trying to grow in our walk together. And then you kind of move down that continuum, and you have directive discipleship. You're saying, okay, look, here's, let me kind of help you walk through the, the Christian life as we look at what God's Word says. And then you have corrective discipleship. We're in relationship with one another, and, and you start talking to me about how you're thinking about your family, and maybe you're kind of uh, talking about some things that aren't very biblical in terms of the workplace. And I say, look, here's what God's Word Word says about how you're to relate to people with whom you work who don't love the Lord, or, or here's how you're to relate to other Christians. I know you're mad at this Christian because of what they did to you. I understand you're upset at your parents because they are not being very kind to you, but here's, here's a biblical way to respond with what you're struggling with. That's, that's directive discipleship. And then kind of even further down the spectrum, you have intensive discipleship. And here's a person who is struggling deeply with the things of, of life. Maybe they have fallen into some very serious sin. And so you're, you're engaged in their life. But, but here's, here's the point that's made in the, in the book and this chapter that deals with this. And I think it is, is exactly right. Every believer needs to find him or herself somewhere on this continuum. And every believer needs to be thinking about how they can be equipped and trained in God's word to help one another. The participants of restoration are those who need restoring and those who are going to be doing the restoring. And the reality is that you and I can find ourselves in, in either group. All of us need to be engaged in this ministry of restoration. It's not the super bad and the super good. It's all of us are engaged in the ministry of restoration. Here's now the second category of things to talk about, the goal of restoration. What is the goal of restoration? Paul brother says this, brothers, if anyone's caught in any transgression, then he says, you who are spiritual should, and what's that word there? restore, restore. The goal of restoration is restoration. So, well, that's not very helpful, Daniel. Uh, what, what do we see? What do, what do we know about that word restore? That word restore is, is a command. It's, it's, a, it's an imperative. It's an instruction. Every person who is a believer who reads this and wants to be obedient to God should understand, I need to be engaged in this. It's also a word that's in the present tense, and there, as Paul uses it, it means that it's, it's ongoing. I don't just say, okay, here's a person who's sinned. I, I pull him aside, and I said, hey, uh, knock it off. We good? Okay, good talk, you know. <laughs> that's, that's not how restoration takes place. It's, it's ongoing. It's continuous. And the word there means to, to put in order. The, 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 the word was used in Paul's day to describe the, the setting of fractured bones or a dislocated bone. It meant to, to fix, to restore. The gospel has used this word whenever 
James and John are in the boat with their father and they're, they're restoring the nets. They're mending the nets. In other words, they're taking that part of the net that was damaged and they're, they're, they're paying close attention to it and they're, they're fixing it. And they're fixing it not so they can throw it away. They're fixing it not so it can be just put into storage and never used again. They're, they're fixing this net so they can use it to catch fish again. Here, here's the third principle. The goal of restoration is, is full recovery of relationships as a believer turns to God and away from the works of the flesh. The, the goal of restoration is not so that we deal with sin and we're not tainted by that person anymore. The goal of restoration isn't just publicly to call someone out so that we can, we can be better than them. The goal of restoration is, is a full recovery of relationships as a believer turns away from the works of the flesh and says, okay, I know that the works of the flesh are not the works that are going to bring me happiness and joy and delight. And now, because of the ministry of my brothers and sisters in Christ, I see the beauty and the glory of Jesus, and I want to turn away from those things that are worthless, and I want to turn to the beauty of Jesus, and I want to be restored in my relationship with God, and I want to be restored in my relationship with other believers, not out of a sense of, of shame, not out of a sense of, of uh, a worldly sorrow, not out of a sense of, well, I, got it. I guess I kind of have to do this to make myself feel better. I, I want to do this in order to, be, to experience the, the fullness of joy. You know, I've mentioned before that sometimes flipping through church directories can be very sad. And sometimes I've, I've flipped through old church directories from other churches that I've gone to or even Bethany Community Church, and there's just sorrow as I sometimes see pictures of people who are no longer walking with the Lord. People who've, who've fallen away from the faith. It, it's, it brings me to, literally to tears sometimes. But as I was thinking about it this, this past week, and pulling up a, a directory again, I, I thought about it from a different perspective. You know, I can flip page after page of directories and, and I can also see story after story of God's gracious restoration of people to himself. And, and, you know, honestly, I have a better perspective probably than most people in the church just because of the nature of the ministry that I have in the church. And so I, I, can, I can know stories of, of restoration of, of people that, that never become public. And, it is, it's, and you know stories that I don't know of, of, of grace-fueled care for people, for, for people's soul and, and a process that was bathed in humility, which, which brings people in, into relationship with, with one another again, restores them as they see the beauty of Jesus Christ. The goal of restoration would be full recovery of relationships as, as sin is repented from and they see the, a person sees the beauty of God and turns to him. Paul in Philippian, uh, sorry, in Philemon talks to Philemon about his slave Onesimus. And there's obviously been this in incredible breach of relationship between Onesimus and Philemon. And, and Paul talks about how Onesimus has responded to the gospel. And then he says these words in verse 15 and verse 16. This perhaps is why he was parted from you for a while. This is why Onesimus may have left you for a little while, Philemon, that you might have him back forever, no longer as a bondservant, but more than a bondservant, as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. And so anything less than, than Philemon and Onesimus being restored in a, a fullness of relationship and even a deeper relationship, more, uh, even in a more uh, profound relationship, now that Onesimus has responded to the gospel, anything less than that would have been failure in Paul's mind. And the same is true for you and me. As we think about the, the beauty of restoration in Jesus Christ, we, we have joy as we think about the fullness of this restoration. Anything less than that 
you know, people saying, well, I guess we'll just agree to disagree, or I guess we'll just kind of keep going to the same church but not talk to each other. Anything fullness, anything less than the fullness of restoration, restoration in relationship is, is failure. Now, before we go on, um, l- let me give a couple uh, caveats here, a, a couple of, of some misunderstandings we can have as we think about this in the relationship to the, the church context. The goal of restoration is, is full recovery of relationships. So we want to mend, we want to want to fix. Something's been broken. A person's been walking in the flesh, and we want to see relationships restored. We want to see that person brought back in the body of Christ. Now, sometimes people can say, well, um, does that mean there's no change in the relationship, or is there no change in the role of the person who has found themselves outside of, of relationship. So for example, a person in a position of leadership, a, a, a teaching pastor falls into immorality or um, does something terrible with the church finances. Does that mean, does, does restoration mean that He's preaching again the next week after that, that process of restoration begins. And I, th- I think the answer is no, it's, that's not what this means. Or let's say that a, a husband has been abusing his wife and he, he recognizes the, the, the heinousness of that sin and says, okay, I'm, I'm going to repent of that. I'm going to turn to God and experience the beauty of, of being in a relationship with Jesus Christ. Does that mean that he, he doesn't face legal consequences for what he's done? Does that mean there are no more safeguards placed on, on, on his wife and the, the children? No, that's, that's not what this means here. It, it's dicey and each, each situation is different, but what it, what it means, what it, what it does mean is, again, there's this grace-infused care for the soul of the person who sinned. And Everyone bathes the process in humility. Both the person who has sinned and is now repenting is, is humble as they, they approach this process of being restored. And the people who are engaged in this ministry of restoration, there's this grace-infused care for the soul of this person. And there is humility as they approach the person who has sinned. That brings us to the next point, right? The manner of restoration the manner of restoration. We'll just say a couple things about this. And next week we're going to talk a lot about the dangers of restoration. There's a lot of dangers we're going to talk about in the next verses. But here's, here's the manner of restoration. Again, if anyone's caught any transgression, so here's this, here, this is the participants, the person who's caught in the transgression, the person who's restoring them, and the, the goal is restoration. It says, restore him in a spirit of gentleness. And a spirit of gentleness. The spirit is at work and manifesting himself in the life of the person who's engaging in restoration. Remember one of the fruit, one of the, one of the characteristics of the fruit of the spirit we talked about was gentleness. And now it's interesting as Paul goes through these verses, notice he's not talking a lot about the process. And there are other passages that deal more with the process. For example, for example, Matthew 18 describes the, the process. Other passages that talk about the process acknowledge that hard things are going to happen in this process. As you, as, as you find a person who is sinning, you begin to confront them in their sin, which Paul does to Peter in, a few, in Galatians 2. In that process, some hard things are going to happen. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 5 talks about rebuking an elder in the presence of all. That's a, that's a hard thing. In Titus chapter 3, Paul says a person who stirs up division, warn them once and twice, but then have nothing more to do with them. That, that's a hard thing to tell a person, look, because of your persistent pursuit of divisiveness, we're going to, to remove you from fellowship, and we're not going to allow you to engage in some of the, the body life things any longer. Second John chapter 10, if anyone comes to you and doesn't bring good teaching, true teaching, the gospel, don't receive him in your house. Don't give him an agreement. Don't support his ministry. There are going to be 
as we engage in the ministry of restoration, there are going to be hard, hard things that we do. And so saying that we do them with gentleness doesn't mean that they're always going to be easy. Saying that we do things with gentleness doesn't mean that we always do what a person wants us to do. In that, in that ministry, in that, that relationship, what it does mean is that all the things that we're engaging in are, are done with a spirit of, of grace, with the goal of the person's good. And so we do the hard things in a kind way. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 talks about hard things that Paul wants the people in Corinth to do to this man who's in sexual immorality. And he says, do this so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, he talks about this person who's turned back, the same person, I believe. And Paul says, uh, reaffirm your love for them, for him. 1 Thessalonians 5, Paul says, admonish people. He says, but, but be patient with them all. So you're, you're admonishing them, but you're admonishing them with patience. In 2 Thessalonians, Paul talks about, um, again, confrontation, not growing weary and doing good. And he says, if anyone, does, if anyone is disobedient to what we say in this letter, take note of it. Have nothing to do with him that he may be ashamed. Do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. There's a, a difference of relationship with here. In Jude chapter 22, have mercy on those who doubt. And in this passage, Paul is less concerned with laying out, okay, step one is this and step two is this. Instead, he's focusing not on the specifics of the process, but he's more concerned with the manner in which these things are done. And that's the fourth principle, the way in which we expose sin and the way in which we exhort one another to repentance must be gentle. It doesn't mean that we excuse sin. It doesn't mean we don't talk about sin openly. It doesn't mean we don't deal with the depth and the breadth of the sin. It doesn't mean we minimize it. But it means as we encounter one another in areas where we've been caught up in sin, it means we go through the process in such a way that the person grasps our love for the Lord and our love for them. We want to do that so that God can work within their heart to bring about repentance. In other words, as I encounter a brother in Christ and, and I see that, that he's walking in the flesh, and maybe he's walking in the flesh in a way that's, that's harmed me personally. Gentleness means that I, I'm going to deal with it. I, I'm, I'm going to address this, but I'm not going to address this so that I'm glorified. I'm not going to address this because my heart's desire is to see him pay for what he's done or to at least come to the point where he acknowledges before everyone, I've done this and Daniel was right and my, what an amazing guy is Daniel. And everyone goes, oh, poor Daniel is amazing. that he, well, God worked in this person. That's not my goal. I approach this person recognizing with humility, we'll talk about this next week, I could be caught up in this same sin. And I have received grace upon grace from my heavenly Father, and I want this person to receive the same grace. And I don't want anything. I don't want anything in the manner in which I approach him to push him further away from the Lord. I, I, I desperately desire this person to encounter the beauty of Jesus Christ, not the beauty of Daniel Bennett, but the beauty of Jesus Christ so that he can engage in worship of a gracious God and that God can be glorified. And so I'm going to be gentle. Okay, next week we're going to talk about the dangers. Here, just review. Here are the, what are the principles that we looked at? The principles of restoration. Number one, any person in the church can be overtaken by sin. Number two, each of us should be repaired, uh, prepared to help restore our brothers and sisters in Christ. Number three, the goal of restoration is is full recovery of relationships at Bethany Community as we engage in the process of restoration with fullness of restoration of relationship as a believer turns to God, the beauty of him, and away from death of the flesh. And then finally, finally, the, the way in which we expose sin, and the way in which we exhort one another to repentance must be gentle. We're entrusted by God with the ministry of restoring one another to Christ and his
his church. Let's be those who take the gospel not just to the lost, but to the saved. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your gospel, the gospel that I need this morning, the gospel that each of us need this morning, the gospel that tells us that we can be in relationship with you, not on the basis of our works, but on the basis of your grace. And Father, as we walk in the flesh, bring that to our minds. Don't let us be content with fleshly lives. Convict us. Bring people into our lives who love us enough to confront us in our sin in a, in a way that helps us see the folly of sin and the beauty of your son, Jesus. Father, help Bethany Community Church as we commit to relationship with one another to be a place where this occurs, but occurs in a gentle way, in a loving way, in a way that brings glory to the gospel of your son, Jesus. And we pray this in his name. Amen.